welcome everybody to the uh, 22nd uh, Steinberg Bernstein um, Minimally Invasive Visiting Professorship. Um, it's really my pleasure today to introduce my friend and mentor, uh, Gina Adralis. Uh, Gina is currently at Johns Hopkins uh, and she serves as the Chief of Minimally Invasive Surgery there. Um, and also the director of the Mystic Lab, which is their surgical training and innovation center. And she's also the associate director of their bariatric surgery fellowship. Dr. Dallas um, is renowned worldwide for her expertise in hernia surgery, in foregut surgery, um, and uh, in obesity surgery. Uh, she's really an international leader, uh, past president, in fact, the first woman president of the America's Hernia Society. Um, and she'll speak to us this morning about her, um, I, I guess, partly about her Stop the Bulge campaign, uh, which she uh, initiated under her tenure as the president of that society. Um, Dr. Adralis is also interested in quality and health, uh, uh, quality care. And uh, she also served on the executive council of the America's Hernia Society Quality Collaborative to improve safety and quality of hernia surgery. Um, and she's also had a, a really long-standing injury uh, interest, and in I've uh, since I've known her as well in surgical education, and in particular in simulation. Um, and uh, she uh, uh, is also um, the co-director of a surgeoneering, a surgical course for biomedical engineers. Um, she's mentored many women um, in her role as the women uh, uh, as a. a the leader of the Women in Surgery group at, uh, at Hopkins. And um, she spoke to us yesterday about her initiatives in teaching robotic, really innovative initiatives in teaching robotic surgery. And um, she's gonna speak to us today about her, um, her initiatives that I spoke already about hernia prevention. And um, it's really, uh, you know, I, I regret that we couldn't receive her here in person. She certainly had a huge role to play uh, in my life as my mentor, as we trained, as she trained me uh, during my fellowship at Dartmouth. And, uh, and as I mentioned yesterday, she's always been a real friend, a mentor, uh, someone I can always turn to for advice um, in all sorts of different realms. And it's really just been a great privilege knowing you, learning from you. Um, I can really vouch that Gina is probably one of the most caring, kind and meticulous surgeons I have uh, met in my life. And it's really been um, a privilege to work with you and to know you. So we had a great day yesterday of research presentations and a great talk. Um, and I really look forward to your talk this morning. So um, reap what you sow, hernia prevention. Welcome. Thank you so much, Melina. It's so wonderful. Um, even though we're virtual, I do feel really close to you right now. And um, thanks for that special introduction. Um, the special photograph that you took of us in the operating room is hanging on my wall, actually, just beside me here <laughs> in my office. Um, I think uh, the feelings that you shared are mutual for certain. And uh, it's so uh, nice to see other friends here too at uh, Miguel, um, with Jerry Freed and Leanne Feldman and others. Um, I was very impressed uh, with the research that was presented yesterday. So thank you for inviting me to be a part of that. Um, it's very uh, interesting. McGill has always been a surgical leader um, and particularly in middle invasive surgery. And so uh, that was, I learned a lot yesterday. It was terrific. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Make sure this works. Okay, terrific. Can you see that okay? All right, wonderful. So um, I'm going to be talking about hernia prevention, uh, which is a problem that we largely cause <laughs> um, is hernia. So uh, hopefully this will be um, engaging for a number of different specialties. Okay. All right, uh, this is my disclosure. I have a um, research grant. This is an internal uh, grant for some of the uh, robotic surgery skills acquisition uh, research that I spoke with you about yesterday. Um, yesterday, I also learned about a special um, connection between Hopkins and McGill, um, uh, which is very interesting uh, to me. So this is a, a painting here at Hopkins of the four, they're considered the four physician founders here at Hopkins, including uh, William Henry Welch, um, uh, William Stewart Halstead, Howard Kelly, 
as well as William Osler, as you can see there in the front. Uh, these are some uh, photographs from the Hawkins archive showing Sir William Osler. So thank you, McGill, for training him because he had certainly an impactful um, tenure here at Hopkins. Um, there on the left is a picture of him uh, examining a, one of the medical students. So uh, Halstead, uh, as you know, has been uh, renowned for his role in forming the surgical residency, uh, but some of you might not know really his integral role in the development of hernia repair and, the, and outlining the importance of that. Um, so I'll just pay tribute to him for that. Uh, today we'll be scope, um, talking about the scope of the problem of incisional hernia, examine some of the current evidence about prevention and how to put that into action to try to prevent hernias ourselves. Um, he had stated in his um, treatise about inguinal hernia, uh, what he called the radical cure of inguinal hernia, that there is perhaps no operation which has had so much vital interest, both physician and surgeon, as herniotomy, and no operation which by pro the profession at large would be more appreciated than a perfectly safe and sure cure for rupture. So let's dig in. Uh, incisional hernia is a big problem, over 2 million laparotomies per year, and almost 30% of these will develop hernias. Um, so this is really, um, in large, a problem that we create ourselves. The incidence of hernia and hernia recurrence remains very high. Um, in 2006, uh, Polos had uh, published um, about this in 2012, that almost 350,000 hernia repairs in the United States annually um, occurred at a cost of $3.2 billion. Um, and over time, though we've improved different ways of um, repairing hernias, as well as um, uh, an increase in minimally invasive surgery, uh, though there's been a decrease in the laparotomy rate in the United States, there's been a 12% rise in open incisional hernia repair from 2009 to 2013. Some of this uh, may be in part because of the obesity epidemic and how complex um, we're seeing uh, patients after their open abdomens uh, with trauma and so forth. Um, despite some of these advances, the morbidity rate for incisional hernia repair is largely stagnant. Um, and though most of the time this can go well, there certainly can be um, challenging problems. There's a big societal cost as well for hernia disease. Um, you know, cancer and other diseases get a lot of um, play in the press, but hernia affects a lot of people. It causes a uh, great disability. It results in decreased productive workforce and there's escalating healthcare costs, um, which in turn adversely affect our ability uh, to spend money and other important needs, um, such as an education and infrastructure. In fact, it's a billion dollar um, multiple billion dollar industry. In 2019, there was $14.7 billion um, spent in soft tissue uh, repair um, products. Um, these next uh, slides will share some pictures of some complex hernias. Um, they just get more complex. And I heard about one yesterday with a big flank hernia <laughs> that you've seen there at McGill. Um, here's a um, photo of somebody who has loss of domain. These hernias come in all shapes and sizes, and you can uh, just imagine how uh, the sheer size of this hernia can affect one's um, posture and abdominal wall function, um, which is so important to many activities that we do. And uh, the recurrence rate for these um, hernias, both big and small, is higher than we would like to see. Um, there's some rates where the hernia recurrence rate is anywhere from 20 to 50%, even for smaller hernias. Um, and sometimes there's consequences of the repairs themselves. You can see in that right picture, um, sort of a stiff mesh that was causing this patient chronic pain. And although we can fix large hernias, um, such as this, and, and do them well, um, there certainly is a big surgical cost and disability and harm that um, comes to patients who have hernias, such as um, acutely incarcerated hernias and bowel loss. In short, hernia repair ain't easy. Um, there, um, there's a lot of complexity in trying to select the right patients and the right repair for patients. And sometimes things can go wrong. So um, though it's um, uncommon, there can be a bowel injury during laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. Um, and this uh, is estimated to be at an occurrence of um, less than 3%. 
Um, but uh, there's about an 8% risk of colon injury and 20% risk of missed injury in some series. LeBlanc had outlined that the mortality rate for enterotomy um, is significant, um, so that um, across the board with ductal hernia repair, um, the um, bowel injury is really the main cause for mortality after hernia repair, whether that's laparoscopic or open repair. And it can also lead to a significant conversion rate as well with minimally invasive approaches. Dr. Chalvey's group um, published in 2013, the impact of bowel injury. This is a very honest uh, retrospective review that they shared of over 2,300 laparoscopic ventral hernia patients. And they identified 33 patients over 17 years who had enterotomy during that repair. Um, but this came at a great cost with a um, almost 50% uh, complication rate. And the mortality rate among this group was quite high at 6%. Um, and over half the patients required additional surgery within the first six months. So um, it behooves us to uh, perform this repair well, but even in the best of hands, we know there's a significant recurrence rate. If you look at David Flum's data um, and you've uh, seen those hernia repair patients that I shared, um, it's not hard to believe that the reoperation rate over time is significant. And with each subsequent repair, the risk of operation goes even higher. Uh, Mike Liang and uh, Julie Hollihan uh, really attributed this phenomenon to what they refer to as a vicious cycle of complications. You can see there in red with the primary ventral hernia repair that the proportion of patients had a recurrence um, is fairly uh, low. Um, but with each subsequent re repair, you can see that that um, proportion goes up. So each time we repair a hernia, it gets harder to do it in a durable fashion. Um, some of this is uh, because of surgical site infection. So this is the vicious cycle that's attributed um, to that. And this is based on a, a multi-center database of almost 800 patients. Um, you can um, see in this that after a hernia repair, the patients might then have um, a surgical site infection leading to readmission and then hernia recurrence and then another reoperation. And um, so that after the first uh, incisional hernia repair, um, uh, the uh, risk of hernia recurrence uh, continues to go up. Um, and also there are consequences of the hernia repairs that we do. Um, it, uh, particularly if there's intraperitoneal mesh, you can see that there's bowel that gets stuck. It can make it very difficult to repair the subsequent hernia. Um, so it's no surprise that each subsequent hernia is more complex than the first. So what do we do about this um, problem with, with um, something that seems so inevitable? Um, well, oftentimes in medicine and surgery, prevention is better than cure and hernia is no different. So I'm gonna share with you um, perhaps some techniques to bring uh, incorporate into your own practice to reduce the risk. Um, many of us know the benefit of an incisional negative um, pressure wound therapy or wound vac on surgical sites um, that can uh, decrease the risk for infection as well as um, a hernia recurrence after laparotomy. Um, so this was some work that we um, published, um, which is really a continuation of Fred Hauser's work when he was here at um, Hopkins. Um, and specifically looking at a patient population, those with um, methicillin resistant staph aureus, who um, we know is a, um, have is an added uh, risk factor for hernia development and hernia recurrence. And that's because of the increased risk of surgical site infection. So you wanted to see if uh, the incisional back dressing would decrease the rate of postoperative surgical site infection and surgical site occurrence after open ventral hernia repair. And we looked at this um, group, uh, this was from a um, retrospective review of a prospectively collected database from 2018 to 2015 of patients undergoing open ventral hernia repair with known MRSA status. Um, 360 or so of these patients underwent open ventral hernia repair, and about 11% of them had documented MRSA infection at the time of surgery. Uh, this is a more complex patient who had had um, a combined paniculectomy. Um, but you can see the incisional vac over that incision. And when we look at the uh, data um, within 30 days, um, you can see a significant uh, difference in the patients who had a wound back um, had a lesser uh, risk of surgical site infection. 
and a trend toward a lesser risk of surgical site occurrence. And this persisted um, to three months out from the surgery. Um, so the patients with a documented um, staph infection, the time of ventral hernia repair have a higher risk of surgical site occurrence um, and surgical site infection compared to those who don't have MRSA within 90 days. However, um, if you use the incisional vac, it can reduce the risk of surgical site occurrence and surgical site infection in patients. And so hopefully um, cutting off that vicious cycle to reduce hospital stay and readmission risk. What about the kinds of incisions that we do? Um, you know, operating through the linea alba is very um, straight uh, forward, um, but it's probably not the best incision that we can do. Um, the, and so uh, this study uh, by Meissens, who's a known hernia surgeon um, in Europe, looked at the difference between midline and transverse incisions and midline versus paramedia incisions and found that non-midline incisions significantly reduce the risk of incisional hernias. Um, so even uh, if I do a midline incision, I actually um, come over the uh, rectus um, sheath on one side or the other to try to reduce this risk if I can. What about our minimally invasive work? Certainly this um, reduces the risk of surgical site infection as well as wound complications, which can lead to a lesser um, risk of hernia occurrence. Um, however, the trocar site um, hernia rate might be um, in retrospective series seem low at one to 6%. If we look at um, longer term follow up such as patients with laparoscopic cholecystectomy at three years, um, almost a third of those patients developed a hernia. And that's primarily um, because an, um, the umbilical um, port site is a known risk factor for development of a trogrocyte hernia. And many of our patients have an existing small umbilical defect and that raises the risk along with a higher BMI, um, older age, and if there's a surgical site infection as well. Um, we know um, from data that um, a 10 millimeter port site should be closed. Um, in fact, if, the, um, if there is a port site greater than 10 millimeters at the umbilical port, so this may play a role in terms of um, single um, uh, site surgery, that mesh augmentation can decrease the rate of hernia um, occurrence um, significantly from 32% down to 4%. Um, there's limited data about robotic trocars. Uh, there's some um, robotic surgeons like to tout that by placing that port and having less tension around the abdominal wall by placing the port at that remote center of the trocar, that it may decrease the um, pressure at the um, port site and reduce the risk of hernia occurrence. Um, those robotic ports primarily are usually eight millimeters in size. Um, but it really depends on where they are located. And so this is a um, photo, not a, um, a very clear photo, but of a patient of mine who I did a, a robotic repair on. This was a complex hernia um, in a patient with aortic disease. And we use a lateral ports as we often do for ventral hernia um, approach. And uh, she had developed a small bowel obstruction. And you can see when we went back in, and this is um, about a week after um, her initial operation, there's really no healing that we can see on the inside. In fact, on the outside for her skin, um, her skin incisions came wide open as well as, as soon as we took off the dermabond. But you can see this patient had a Richter's hernia. It was actually um, partially um, adherent there and herniated at her um, upper port site. Um, but even the eight millimeter port sites were um, wide and we ended up closing all of our incisions at that um, operation. And um, after this, she did well. But I think when there's um, more traction on a port, particularly in, in the lateral position, you have to be careful as well and certainly check all of your port sites. Um, this really, this patient really showed little um, early healing. And we know that that is important in terms of um, incisional hernia development. Um, there's increasing evidence that incisional hernias are a failure of early wound healing. Um, and this was um, highlighted in a hernia prevention and symposium. The first one uh, was held in 2017, and we just had a, um, a recent one as well um, in September. Wound healing peptides play a role in this healing, and, um, and we have variable um, production of this um, from person to person. And we think that there is failure of early um, healing, uh, particularly decreased or delayed M2 macrophage induction, and that's associated with poor healing and then hernia development. Um, with this, there's uh, decreases in the recruitment of bone marrow derived circulating cells. And so um, it leads to changes in inflammation and this can um, affect uh, ultimately the healing. 
Um, if you happen to study uh, patients early in their um, course after laparotomy, um, it's been uh, linked that early fascial separation of more than a centimeter within 30 days of surgery um, are, um, is, uh, correlates with patients who later develop incisional hernias. So altering these deficiencies has not um, been something that we're ready to do yet. And so this is why uh, we embarked on this hernia prevention campaign um, called Stop the Bulge um, from the American Hernia Society. And I'd like to um, credit um, many of these um, uh, hernia experts who are involved in this campaign, uh, along with the entire um, task force for this. Um, Lord Monaghan uh, noted that um, you should never judge a surgeon before you've seen him closing the wound or her closing the wound. And, um, and this is really um, important because we know the suture material and how we close a laparotomy or even small port incisions um, is very important um, in, in all aspects of our surgical care. We need to pay attention to the um, detail. However, often when you're closing, especially after a long operation, that's when, you know, anesthesia is waking up the patient where, um, you know, more junior staff is, are closing the wound. And we still have to not let our guard down um, because it has consequences later. We know that the critical phase of wound healing is in the early period. Um, after 20, 14 to 28 days, the healing fascia begins to have a strength that is um, self-supporting, but it's still very vulnerable to wound separation. So we have to be careful about our suture choice. Um, by four weeks, only 40% of the fascia's original strength is there. Um, and so if we use a rapidly absorbable suture um, like Vicryl, then, um, you know, that, that loses the majority of strength through hydrolysis, then this can um, um, impair the wound healing and lead to hernia. Um, there can be degradation of some of the suture that we use, which we might otherwise um, uh, deem is, is um, permanent. And so slowly absorbable suture um, as well as non-absorbable suture can uh, retain much of the strength that can help us in terms of preventing um, incisional hernias. Israel Sin Israel is a um, European uh, surgeon who has really dedicated his life. You can see multiple um, manuscripts that he has um, um, published really focused on wound healing and wound complications as well as hernia uh, prevention. This is, um, has amounted to three decades of work and continuous refinement in this. And he published in 2009 um, a randomized controlled trial and then followed this with a multi-center randomized controlled trial in 2015, showing the benefit of a um, four to one stitch length to wound length ratio um, in reducing the risk of incisional hernia. So uh, this, uh, I'm sure, is familiar to many of you, but, um, but this has been shown in a, uh, to reduce the risk of recurrence and infection. So this is the uh, single center randomized control trial of over um, 700 um, patients, and they were randomized to either a small bite closure um, or a large bite closure, and a suture length to wound length ratio greater than four was used in both groups. So though his earlier work had shown the benefit of um, a small interval, smaller bite closure, we um, there's different combinations of that to lead to the four to one. And so um, in this study, the follow-up study, it showed that the short stitch, uh, meaning a um, fascial um, purchase of uh, five to eight millimeters and a travel of five to eight millimeters in between each suture um, resulted in a lesser wound infection risk um, of half of that with a long stitch group and a lower incisional hernia risk as well. What about if you had a surgical site infection, which we know increases the risk of a subsequent incisional hernia? Um, we know that this also helps reduce the risk of developing incisional hernia, even in those contaminated cases by using that short stitch um, technique. So how do you do that? Um, and is it applicable um, to your patient population? It might be more applicable in Montreal than it is here where I am in, in uh, Maryland, just because of the obesity rate. Um, because the suture that's uh, used in these trials in Europe is really a 2-0 um, suture. And uh, you'll see the BMI for these patients is actually um, quite low um, from US standards. So um, this technique uses a um, uh, modified half-blood knot to start, uh, so a self-locking knot. 
And the reason this is used is because it reduces um, the, um, the amount of uh, suture. And um, when you are tying a knot just conventionally, that strength of the um, suture is decreased by about 40%. And so it is more preserved when you use a, a self-locking knot. And perhaps it might reduce the risk of development of suture sinuses or stitch abscesses, which can lead to a bigger uh, wound complication and infection. At the completion of a closure, the Aberdeen knot is used. Um, this is very similar to what we would use in a subuticular closure. And a taper tip is recommended. Um, this facilitates smaller bites. So instead of a very large, um, heavy uh, needle that you might use, a double-stranded number one PDS, for instance, uh, you want to use a um, smaller um, taper tip and this just facilitates this uh, facilitates a small bite closure. Um, this is how I learned to uh, close a laparotomy when I was in training, and that we know that that's really not best. That you really just want to get the fascia, um, the strength layer of the abdominal wall. And this is a preferred suturing pattern: six millimeters or so from the edge of the fascia, and about four to five millimeters apart. If you think about this, um, it helps distribute the strength. So this is sort of the difference between taking large bites with a three ring binder versus a multiple um, smaller bites with, with um, shorter interval closure. And what does that mean in practice? Um, in Israelson's group and in the trial that was done in the Netherlands subsequently, they actually measure the suture tails um, that you cut um, to really figure out how much suture you used compared to the wound length to ensure that you have a four to one ratio. And in those trials and is in, in Israelson's uh, OR, if that's not the case, then you actually start over. <laughs> so this is a, I believe this is Eric Colley's um, actual uh, video who uh, he serves on the Stop the Bulge uh, campaign. And I believe was your visiting professor before. Um, this shows him just sort of calculating what the wound length is and, and the suture that was used, two sutures um, in this case and then doing the self-locking knot. So it takes a little uh, practice if you're not used to doing this. Really sliding that down and uh, reminding your um, staff that this is a 2-0 and not a heavy suture, so it doesn't break. And then uh, closing this, uh, is the strength layer. So in the STITCH trial, which is a multi-center Dutch trial, um, again, it showed the benefit of a small bite um, closure at one year follow-up, so it was uh, durable over a year. Um, there was a slightly longer operative time, about four uh, minutes, but no difference in the adverse events. Uh, but I'll point out in this trial that the BMI, average BMI was 24. Um, and then um, in the uh, Dutch trial, it was, um, sorry, in the Swedish trial, it was 26. Um, so uh, there are some remaining concerns or questions unanswered about, is this applicable to the more obese patient? The European Hernia Society has adopted this, recommending continuous suturing, avoiding the rapidly absorbing sutures, and instead using a, a slowly absorbable monofilament of the um, aponeurosis only and the small bite technique. Um, and then for laparoscopy, recommending uh, the smallest trocars when possible and closing any trocars that are 10 millimeters or greater um, and paying particular um, attention to those who um, are doing single site surgery. Um, there are multiple trials that are out there now also looking at placement of mesh or mesh augmentation at the time of laparotomy. And there's some mixed data about this. Um, but uh, this is a, a complex uh, group. You can see um, that there are procedural or preoperative patient and procedural factors that affect the development of incisional hernia, and this can come at a significant cost. Um, so that um, in this group of 12,000 um, patients, there were multiple um, hernias, and the costs amounted to um, $17.5 million just for these 400 patients. So it does um, play a um, role in our larger healthcare system. Um, when we develop incisional hernias. So can we look at broader data to see if um, 
uh, there are certain patient groups who are higher risk. And if we can uh, treat those um, any differently, this is a pre-med trial looking at patients with abdominal aortic aneurysm, who we know are at increased risk for incisional hernia. And they uh, use mesh augmentation as an onlay um, or a sublay and really found no difference um, between those, um, but in both groups, reducing the risk of incisional hernia development. We know that high-risk patients have hernias more often and sooner. Um, and so it, perhaps if we can identify those most at risk, um, then we can judiciously apply uh, the MASH um, because uh, there is concern perhaps about introducing then complications of the MASH, particularly in contaminated cases. Um, but perhaps for the folks with the abdominal aortic aneurysm, this is an appropriate group. And again, this was a, another study, multicenter um, trial in Belgium. Um, that showed that the risk of incisional hernia at a two-year follow-up um, was basically zero um, compared to um, where there is a primary suture closure of the laparotomy in uh, almost 30% um, percent of patients. Um, and with that, there were no mesh complications um, in the mesh augmentation group, um, but it did um, add uh, some time to the OR. So there are now um, eight randomized controlled trials that indicate that prophylactic mesh augmentation might prevent incisional hernia. So it could be something to consider, particularly in uh, patients with um, who have triple A's or in obesity surgery, um, those who are at higher risk, maybe those that you might um, consider where the benefit of placing mesh versus the low risk of mesh complications um, would lead you to place mesh. Um, in this uh, systematic review of 14 studies and over a thousand patients who received prophylactic mesh, um, having the uh, mesh augmentation significantly reduced the risk of hernia development, but there was an increase in seroma, um, not when it was placed in a retrorectus space, although um, many might be wary about um, violating the retrorectus space for a first time laparotomy. Um, but, and there also was some increase in chronic pain. So it doesn't, it does um, have a little um, risk to it. Um, it might increase the risk of surgical occurrence as such as seroma is shown here, um, but it doesn't increase the risk of infection or chronic infection. So this led the European Hernia Society guidelines to um, um, cautiously um, highlight the benefit of mesh augmentation in terms of the reduction in hernia occurrence. Um, without increasing the risk of wound infection. Uh, but the evidence overall for this is still rather weak. And so it's not quite ready for prime time. There are several trials that we hope to um, be completed in the next year or so. So although the data are favorable and consistent, um, larger trials are needed. Um, there are several talks yesterday about colorectal surgery. So I'll briefly um, share some um, uh, words about peristomal hernia prevention. Um, peristomal hernias uh, can be a vexing problem. Um, I know they're like the hernia that I most dread uh, when I see them in clinic because um, they happen at a high rate. The incidence is estimated to be 20 to 50%. And in fact, when patients are undergoing surveillance C CT for other reasons, the rate is almost 80% when assessed by CT. Um, these can lead to pain and linkage of the stoma sites for patients who already had a lifestyle um, change just with having the ostomy. Um, sometimes it can cause skin irritation or lead to bowel obstruction. The incidence is highest in the first two years, but there's a lifelong risk and the recurrence um, after a um, peristomal hernia repair is quite high. So, um, Early randomized controlled trials demonstrate a significant uh, decrease in the peristomal hernia incidence with um, placing mesh. And one might be concerned about um, placing mesh around a contaminated site, um, but um, this was um, really recommended um, to use non-absorbable synthetic mesh uh, during end colostomy construction based on these early um, studies. Um, however, there was some concern about infection and mesh erosion, and this really does limit the surgeon enthusiasm and in incorporation of this technique. And um, now it's very confusing because there's some conflicting reports about whether you should be placing mesh at the time or not. So let's uh, delve in a little bit into the trials that are out there to help guide our practice. 
Um, in this uh, double-blind randomized controlled trial of rectal cancer patients who underwent APR, there are 24 um, patients in each arm with a median follow-up of 26 months. And they use an intraperitoneal sugar bake repair where the mesh is underlying the actual um, abdominal wall orifice um, with a lightweight composite propylene-based synthetic mesh. And this was actually uh, based on early work by Israel Sin that um, showed that polypropylene placed there around the bowel had um, Really, they had no mesh complications in that group or infection. Um, when they uh, studied these patients, both by exam as well as CT scan, the CT detected um, a higher hernia rate, as might be expected. Um, and this was um, higher in the uh, controls than with the mesh augmentation um, of a significant difference of 64.5% um, down to 25%. Um, there was a surgical repair in one symptomatic patient in the mesh group at one year. You can see in the Kaplan-Meier uh, curve um, that um, over time, and particularly with CT scan, that there's a um, greater risk of developing a hernia over time. Um, in this perspective randomized uh, study, um, this was a, a longer term follow-up of an earlier study. The earlier uh, Verima study showed that there was a benefit of mesh augmentation. However, in this longer term uh, study, um, it wasn't as clear. Um, so they used a keyhole technique with a laparoscopically placed pre-peritoneal uh, poly polyvinyl fluoride mesh. And the mesh group was slightly heavier, heavier um, higher BMI compared to the uh, non-mesh group. And uh, a clinically detectable hernia was noted in 20% of the mesh group compared to 33% of the controls. And there was no difference in complications. Only one patient in the MASH group had a hernia repair within the five years. This is a longer term study. Um, but overall, they found there was really no difference in the hernia rate in the long term data, but there was a significant decrease in those patients who felt symptomatic. And some of that is probably the laxity around the um, stoma site that might prompt patients to seek repair. Um, in this um, study, as I had highlighted by Israel, so this was a follow-up study to his original one, looking, um, which was a, um, a randomized study of prophylactic, large, poor, lightweight, um, partially absorbable sublay mesh in 27 patients at 12 months. Um, only one patient in the mesh group had a hernia at one year, um, and uh, as opposed to half of the patients who didn't have mesh developed a peristomal hernia. So it remains a vaccine problem. They define hernia in this study as any protrusion in the vicinity of the stoma. And this was assessed by a blinded investigator. Um, at the five-year follow-up, uh, they found that um, there were um, a, a much higher rate of patients who developed a peristomal hernia and those who did not have the mesh augmentation and five of those required repair at five years. And those with mesh, only two out of the 15 patients had uh, developed a hernia and none of those uh, required repair. Um, they also importantly found there were no fistulas or stenosis or mesh infections or mesh removal. And they continued to uh, do interval examinations of these patients beyond the five years and found that there were no additional hernias that developed um, beyond that time frame, even up to 83 months um, with the mesh. Um, but they did note there, this is a time dependent risk, as we know, for all hernia development. Without mesh, 50%, there was a 50% hernia rate at one year. Um, and um, at five years, it was even higher, um, where the majority of patients, over 80%, had developed a peristomal hernia. Uh, there have been other randomized controlled trials to look at this. And we can glean some information. Again, in the study, there was a cumulative incidence of uh, peristom peristomal hernia development over time. 6% of the patients with mesh developed a hernia, as opposed to 46%, almost half of the patients in the control group had developed a hernia. Um, and uh, there were really uh, limited complications, except in the control group, there was one um, patient who had stomal necrosis and required revision. So um, we know uh, from the study, there's other things that learning points that are embedded in this trial. Um, one is that there's really a poor correlation between clinical exam assessment and the CT findings of hernia. Although one might argue the clinical significance of a CT, a radiographic um, discovered hernia alone um, compared to a symptomatic or um, one seen on exam. The fascial opening um, around the stoma did increase over time in the patients without mesh. And so this suggests 
that um, the stabilization of the fascial orifice is possibly important in the development of hernia um, in hernia and also in hernia prevention. So um, there have been other studies as well. This is a stoma mesh trial, a randomized control trial of over 200 patients um, who had open colorectal surgery, again, using the polypropylene sublate technique. Um, but in this study, they found no difference in the hernia rate in the mesh group versus the non-mesh group, both by clinical exam and radiologic um, exam. And if you look at the numbers here, this was a much larger trial compared to Israelson's study. Um, this was over 200 patients. Um, in another uh, trial, this um, assembled 15 um, uh, randomized control trials in the systematic review in over 1,000 patients. The overall rate of development of parasomal hernia was about um, a third of the patients. Um, and the patients with MASH were half as likely to develop hernias. Um, they were also less likely to undergo repair. Um, and it was um, found that the sublay um, positioning of the MASH might be more beneficial, but this was based on non-randomized comparisons. Um, when you look at the forest uh, plots, uh, there is some slight uh, favorability regarding mesh versus not um, in, in uh, reducing the hernia risk. Um, and, uh, and, and also those requiring repair. Um, when we look um, more closely at these trials, the ones that um, did not show a difference compared to the earlier uh, trials by Jeans and um, Israelson um, were larger trials. Um, those shown in red involved 100 to 232 patients. They were also multi-center. And these trials that were larger and multi-center did not show a difference. And so um, what can we conclude from this? Because uh, they're incongruent. We know that um, the risk of parasomal hernia appears to increase over time after colorectal surgery. There's no increase in complications with mesh placement. There might be a difference in the clinical hernia rate with mesh augmentation, but there's mixed results when we look at them uh, from a radiologic standpoint. Um, and larger studies and multi-center trials have not shown a significant difference. Um, but we can learn from this that there are several characteristics of the available studies. Um, we know that there's a limit to our understanding of the parasitic hernias and their prevention. Um, and, and that's because there's a lack of standardization regarding the definition of parasitic hernia. Um, is it really a clinical um, diagnosis or um, should we define these radiologically? Um, there are also different types of mesh that were used in these trials. There's different positioning of the mesh, whether it was onlay or sublay. Um, or preperitoneal, and there's a lot of heterogeneity um, and, and small sample size in some of the investigations. So while there may be a benefit of mesh augmentation, um, it's not quite ready for prime time ongoing study is needed. So there are still some things that we don't know about hernia prevention. Um, we do know that there is a benefit to a meticulous um, fascial closure at the time of laparotomy with a four to one ratio, but does this apply to patients who are heavier? Does it apply um, for whenever we do primary fascial closure for hernia repair? Uh, mesh augmentation may be beneficial, but um, perhaps just reserved right now for high risk patients. Um, and it does highlight the need for better identification of patients at higher risk for herniation and perhaps individualizing the care and targeting the prophylaxis. So just to conclude, no matter um, what measures are taken, doctors will sometimes falter. And it isn't reasonable to ask us that we achieve perfection. Um, that's impossible um, to achieve, but it is reasonable to ask us that we never cease to aim for it. And so um, hopefully these studies will be ongoing so we can um, see how best to care for patients, both at their first operation and their subsequent hernia repairs. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you very much, Dr. Adralis, for that very comprehensive uh, review of uh, hernia prevention, hernia disease, uh, and still a really um, <clears throat> complex problem that I don't think we've uh, quite mastered yet as surgeons. Um, I think I saw Leanne's hand going up. Dr. Feldman, do you have a question? Well, I was, I was just clapping, but um, I could also ask a question, if I may. Um, Gina, that's a great talk. Thank you so much. And for spending uh, the whole afternoon with us yesterday and uh, 
uh, giving such great feedback and uh, uh, to all of our presenters. And we really appreciate the uh, the time and the effort that we spent. And I agree that we do owe you uh, uh, a better experience and visit to the Ozer Library and uh, all of that uh, another time. But I just wanted to ask you, uh, in terms of uh, prevention of hernias in, in bigger patients, um, can you just like, why, why, what would be, um, understand the, 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 you know, the increased pressure in the abdominal wall for a bigger patient, but I'm not sure it's been, you know, um, if it hasn't been um, proven that it's not effective, what would be the downside in assuming that it would be effective if it's effective for other patients as well? I mean, we haven't seen a huge um, increase in incisional hernia when I, I tend to use the, the you know, the stitch uh, trial technique four to one. And so maybe not the Aberdeen knot, but other other aspects of it. I have tried to, to learn that, but it doesn't seem to stick for me. But um, in, in bigger patients as well, I haven't seen like a big increase in dehistance rate, or but I've heard it said many times, yes, it hasn't been uh, trialed, but I'm not sure why not flip it and say until it's been sort of shown not to be effective or dangerous, why wouldn't we just have the same approach for bigger patients as well? I'm in the same camp as you, Leanne. I use the technique uh, uniformly um, with it. And I think that, um, and that's because I believe those earlier trials, I mean, um, they were very well done. Um, I know uh, Ava Dierenberg, who um, led the Netherlands trial, she actually went to each site. I mean, it's easy to do in a smaller country like that, each site and observe the surgeons and make sure they were using the you know, correct techniques. Um, and so it was a very robust trial and it showed a difference. Um, I think that um, we do know that other techniques that have been used um, in many parts fail. And that's because of the buttonholing, which I think is more um, a risk in patients who are obese um, because of the strain on those single like interrupted sutures or heavy suture. Uh, so um, I, I tend to adopt it as well. Now the mesh augmentation, um, I think that's something that I'm not quite ready for uh, yet. Um, and part of that too is uh, it's a complex thing to, to embark on. Um, I don't know how it would be there in Canada um, here. You know, mesh is expensive, uh, polypropylene less so, um, but you don't also, you can't bill for it there. You know, it's being studied now and John Fisher has developed a, a training um, CBT code for that, um, you know, a trial code that you can use if you're implanting mesh. Um, so, but uh, more often, I think I would rather just reserve that for the hernia repair because we know that that does work and has a benefit. Um, there is a question uh, from uh, Dr. Chaudhary in the chat. Thanks for a great talk and review. Would you have any specific comments regarding hernia prevention in the immunocompromised? Two contexts, one patient's receiving chemo before and after surgery and two solid organ transplantation. A uh, very good question. I, I think there is uh, limited data about this, um, but um, knowing the importance of that early uh, wound healing, um, I think if it is possible to, um, you know, time a surgery, um, and you, you might not be able to do that if this is the index operation for the cancer, um, but time it in such so that the patients are not at their nadir in terms of um, infection risk, then that would be beneficial. Um, the, uh, and then for a solid organ uh, transplantation, I think the, um, uh, the challenging patients are those uh, for liver transplantation, uh, just because of the initial ascites. Now with the transplantation, that should improve, of course, but there's a lot of fluid shifts and edema afterward. Um, I would definitely adhere to, um, you know, the shorter, the kind of the stitch tile techniques um, with that. Um, although I probably would be a little concerned about using maybe the 2-0. I still might use a zero, um, you know, long acting absorbable suture for those patients. Uh, and again, meticulously uh, reducing the risk for infection. I think that's one area if you're doing a big laparotomy for those types of patients, that the uh, negative pressure incisional vac might be of help. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Deckelbaum, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you so much for a great talk and great review. And um, my question is, you know, one, one of my concerns always 
is should they need surgery in the future? And we deal with a younger uh, trauma population that are at early stages of their life and, you know, putting large meshes and things like that. And uh, um, should they need cancer surgery in the future or things like that often further complicates that. Uh, how does that play into your decision-making into putting in mesh or not? Especially because I, I think there is so much variability uh, in terms of the results of the studies for mesh, for not mesh, for the different techniques, for the different patient populations, that I think you're right. Often what happens is, is that the trainees are left to close fascia. And in fact, if you probably just pay proper attention to the closure uh, using good technique, then hopefully that plays an important role in reducing hernia rates. Yeah, um, excellent uh, thoughts. I, I do you agree the particular attention sometimes even just having a separate closing set you know for the closure just gets everybody um, you know keeps everyone's head in the game in terms of meticulous closure at the end instead of trying to close when you know the scrub techs are counting and there's a lot of commotion um, and and folks are waking up the patient so um, I, I do think, you know, staying with a surgery till the very end, uh, until the dressing's on, um, is very important. In terms of the mesh, um, uh, again, as I said, I'm not quite ready, actually, for the mesh augmentation. But if I were to put that um, at the time, uh, if I was concerned about a high-risk patient, I might, you know, consider it for a AAA patient, for instance, um, that I, I wouldn't put it intraperitoneally. In fact, for uh, my hernia repairs, I prefer to place it outside of the perineal cavity wherever possible. Um, I know I shared that one picture, the robotic approach, where um, that patient's, because of prior surgeries, there, there was basically no posterior closure, so we had to use intraperitoneal mesh. But even if you can place it preperitoneal, that protects it some. Uh, there's been um, some studies, Mary Han uh, published a study looking at the impact of an intraperitoneal mesh and subsequent um, surgeries, and it does make the um, next surgery much longer and it increases the risk of enterotomy at the next um, surgery. And so if we can keep the mesh out of the abdominal cavity, there's the benefit of that. Um, now, if you're using it for mesh augmentation, I think at an initial laparotomy, if you want to venture, venture there, I probably wouldn't use the retrorectus space. You might consider putting it preperitoneal, um, only because the retrorectus space, I think, um, I look at that as sort of a holy space um, for hernia repair. Uh, there's been different studies, you know, if you uh, look at multiple different types of techniques for hernia repair and multiple types of meshes, uh, as Ben Polis has, has highlighted before, there's like over 200,000 different combinations that you can use. However, in a systematic review that was done at um, uh, Georgetown, it showed that there is some benefit to the retrorectus um, mesh repair with a low risk of hernia recurrence um, of 5% and a low um, rate of wound complications. And so um, that's sort of a go-to um, space for a really um, good hernia repair. And I wouldn't um, put mesh in just for um, prophylaxis with that. I hope that answered your question. Uh, another question from the chat, if we have a few more minutes. Um, thank you for the amazing review and engaging talk, says Dr. Dumitra. Could you provide us with some advice for abdominal closure after open high pec? Is there evidence to use the TUO technique in these patients? I would say there's no evidence to use the 2O technique in those patients. In terms of the 2O suture, definitely, I think I would still use the small interval, um, you know, four to one closure for those patients. Um, I know in our high tech patients, those patients are very complex. They're in, you know, the ICU often there's lots of um, different shifts and edema and so forth, depending on what was done. Um, so um, I personally would be cautious about um, using the 2.0 uh, level suture, but there's really no evidence that I'm aware of about hernia prevention in those patients. Any uh, residents have any questions? Anybody else have any questions or comments? How do you close your port sites usually? Like for a lap coli, for example, what's your what's your go-to technique for a non-obese patient having a lap coli? 
And I still I don't have any of those. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, one, I make sure really look and make sure that there's not an umbilical hernia. I think that's why, you know, in that um, study that I shared about a third of the patients had a hernia develop at that umbilical site. Um, so if there's an umbilical hernia there, then I would close it and use a long acting absorbable suture. Um, and, uh, and so usually that's what I would use uh, in a more straightforward, a less obese patient um, in no hernia. I probably just use a vicral stitch. But and you do like a figure of eight, you do figure of eight. Yeah. Just a figure of eight. Yeah. So nothing to, and if it is a hernia, then you use a long acting. Absorbable. Long acting absorbable, or I might even um, consider a small, you know, preperitoneal, um, uh, large, poor, lightweight polypropylene mesh as well. The evidence would support that. Okay, we have one, a uh, couple more questions in the chat. We have a uh, three more minutes, so let's go for it. From Dr. Destinia, thanks for the great talk. What are your thoughts about combining both techniques with obese patients? Larger suture with a shorter interval. Um, that's actually what I do. <laughs> so I use a um, I. Um, with the more obese patients, um, I, I'll use a zero um, PDS in a shorter interval. There is a multi-center trial that's going on in the U.S. right now um, that we'll hope is leading um, to look at this as well. So hopefully we'll have more um, answers about um, this uh, more obese population in the U.S. And we have one final, or maybe we'll see. Uh, thanks for the engaging talk from uh, Dr. Al Masuri whom you met yesterday, she's our MIS fellow. Do you routinely close the XL ports in your bariatric patients, the 10 millimeter ones? I do close them. Um, although I think there's mixed evidence about that, um, Sophia. The, uh, Sharon Tofai has um, looked at that as well and, and found that actually there was a, she thought there was even a higher risk with closure of developing problems at that port site. Um, but I think that uh, depends on how um, it's closed. So, you know, a single suture may not be enough for those port sites like we normally would, like with a Carter Thomas, you know, a fascial closure device. Um, you might have to put a figure of eight um, in those patients uh, to prevent port site um, hernias. So if there are no further questions, I wanna thank you again for your talk this morning uh, and for yesterday and again for spending the whole day with us yesterday. It was really a great, uh, a great couple of days and uh, good luck with your cases this afternoon and uh, hopefully we'll be able to receive you in Montreal in person someday soon. <laughs> I look forward to that. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate your attention.